Alrighty, everyone. Today we're going to do our first week of notes. And here we go. So welcome back. All right. This is what we're going to cover today. We've got site judging, like how to determine if a site is done well or not, uh, or done poorly. What is the internet, anyways? What makes a good website? What are some different text editors that we can use? And uh, I'm not sure if we're going to cover Slack Messenger or not. We may or may not use that this class, but we'll talk about it anyways. All right, let's keep going. All right, so um, when you think about a site, think about keep a, a site that you use a lot in your head every day. Um, think about it, and what about that site is it that you like? Is it the content? Is it um, the way it's laid out? Is it easy to use? These are all things that we have to think about. All right, so think about your favorite site. What is it that you like about that website? You know, what is your least favorite site? Like, what site do you just not like to go to, but you go to anyways just because you have to? So let's take a look about what is the internet anyways. Back now at 56 pass, I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. About, I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, what I heard something big fight up in the lunchroom the other See? week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE com. I mean, well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is what does it, it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's you like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It's not, it's, it's not in there. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right, and others can access it. And right, it's, and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. It Just came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie, you know, but you don't need you don't need that you don't need a phone line to operate. No, internet? no. All right, so back in 1994, you can see they were just in the very beginnings of the internet. They didn't even know what the at symbol was. <laughs> so it's a little bit uh, amusing to think back um, how, we, how we looked at the internet. I remember back when I was, you know, when the internet was first starting, like getting your own email address was very exciting. Now, of course, you can have as many email addresses as you want, and, and you know, it's not a big deal. So the internet started basically back in 1958, all right? It's called the uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency, which started it. And they, in turn, created something called the ARPANET, which was uh, basically only run in certain universities. And they, they took like big computers, big mainframe computers, and you could talk between those big computers at different universities. So it wasn't like in everyone's house or anything like that. It was just, you know, only in, only in certain spots you could use it. And it was basically started by the military. And it eventually it grew and grew and grew until the internet what is what it is today, where you can, you know, talk to anyone anywhere in the world, essentially. So the internet, does not equal, this exclamation point equal sign means does not equal the World Wide Web. Right? The internet is the physical network of the computers all over the world, right? So all the, compu all the, all the, um, the computers, the servers, all that kind of stuff, that's, that's the internet. The World Wide Web is a virtual network of websites connected by hyperlinks. Whenever you click on a link to something in a, in a browser like Chrome or whatever browser you happen to use, you're clicking on a hyperlink, right? 
which connects two different websites. It could be within the same website, all right? Or it could be, uh, you know, to uh, another website altogether. And we'll learn how to do all that pretty soon, all right? Oops, flipping around all over the place. So again, the internet is essentially the, the physical stuff, all right? And the World Wide Web is the, um, the actual websites and the links between them. Think of it that way. So this is a picture of Tim Berners-Lee. He is the guy who basically uh, is credited with in inventing the internet. And we'll go over a little bit about him in a second. All right. So he's a British computer scientist known as the inventor of the World Wide Web. Right. So he started off at CERN. And he saw that scientists were having difficulties sharing information. So they'd have to, you know, uh, I don't know, they'd write a paper or something like that, and they'd have to wait for it to be published, or say they're, you know, they want to work on something at the same time, they have to make phone calls and stuff like that, it was a big pain, or they want to share a document. There wasn't any easy way to do that. So he created something called HTML, which is a programming language you use to put stuff on the web. My microphone a little bit closer. Then he created URLs, which are unique addresses all right, that every website has. So you can easily find stuff on the web. And then lastly, he in, uh, invented something called HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, right, which is a protocol with the rules all right, that allows computers to receive web resources. So you click on a link to something, it, uh, it will take you to somewhere else, essentially. Yeah. Then he went from CERN to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 94, uh, to find the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, which is, uh, you can go there at w3schools.com, and you can find a lot of good resources there about uh, working on websites and different things that you can do like that. We'll probably use some, uh, some of their stuff during this class. Well, during this, yeah, during this class, I guess. And he's still the director of W3C to this day. All right. So back in the early days of the internet, right, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, we just talked about, he created a, uh, HTML. And uh, HTML, like I said, it was just by itself. There's not a whole lot you can do with it. But you know, back in the day, it was revolutionary. So when the internet first started, this is basically monochrome, meaning like just one color on your screen, and uh, the, the, the run like you know intense graphics or anything. So it was mostly just text. So you didn't need to think about you know design or uh, what your website looked like too much. As long as you had information, it was easy. There wasn't a whole lot you could do with it. So the design didn't really come into it. It was just you know get the information out there, and that was about it. All right. And if we click on this link over here, we can find first website ever created. Here we go. First website ever created. Info.cern.ch. We've got a little bit of basic text, all right? We've got uh, some links over here, some hyperlinks. We click on them, take us to different places. All right. Very basic stuff. So we're not worried about, you know, where everything is located or anything like that. There's just some some headlines, <laughs> some text, and really there wasn't any pictures there. There weren't any pictures or anything like that. So it was basically as easy and as simple as it could be. So this is when we're talking about a URL, right? This is what we're talking about. You use it all the time, all right? And it gets... Um, it gets simpler and simpler to, to like a lot of stuff you don't have to type anymore. It used to be, you know, when you first gave someone a website, you have to say like www and blah 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 and all that kind of stuff, all right? It was, always was like http colon slash slash. That was always implied, and a lot of times the www is implied as well, or doesn't it even exist, all right? But most sites, when they first started out in the early days of the internet, it was www for World Wide Web. Nowadays, that's you know, you don't even refer to that. And so the whole website name 
or the whole uh, uh, link to it is, is the, the URL, a universal resource locator. That's another way to think of it. So someone tells you like the, the URL to a website, they're including everything, all right? The hypertext transfer protocol, all right? And the domain name. So the, the google.com, that's the domain name, hypertext transfer protocol, and the whole thing all put together is a URL. Now, what a URL does essentially is it translates an IP address into something that we can use as a human being because it's going to be, uh, it's much easier for us to remember google.com than it is to remember, you know, 234.126.52. You know, that gets much more complicated. Ah, there we go. Try that. All right, so essentially, like an IP address is just uh, every website has an IP address, which is just the what the computer uses, all right, to transfer people between uh, transfer information between different websites. Whereas the URL is what you, we as a human being, use. I mean, you could type in the IP address, it would take you to the exact same place as whatever the URL is, but it's much easier for us to remember what the URL is. The uniform, or I, was, I say universal sometimes, I mean uniform resource locator, all right, is the web address. And they say URL, web address, same thing, all right? IP address, web address, URL, they all take you to the same place, but the URL and the web address, slash web address, is basically, it's a human translation of whatever the IP address is, all right? So it points to some website and retrieves the information. Now there, uh, two methods, all right, two hypertext transfer protocols that we use, all right, and a lot of times nowadays we're using HTTPS, which is the secure way to do it, all right, it's got some um, encryption, so say for example you're, you're logging into your bank or whatever, all right, you want to use, you want to make sure, I mean all banks will do this automatically, that it, uh, you're, you're transferring the information securely, Right. If you're just going to, you know, like, I don't know, some news site or something like that, it doesn't really matter if it's secure. But if you're doing any kind of, especially financial information or anything, any kind of sensitive data, you want to make sure that it's, um, it has HTTPS on the top over there. And most of the time, this will be done automatically for you nowadays. All right, uh, then the domain name, all right, so like google.com, uh, you know, ESPN.go.com or whatever it is, all right? That's the domain name, all right? So, like, when you, as a human being, that type something in, that's the domain name. All right, here's a picture of Jerry the Mailman. He's the one who delivers the information to you, right? It's a picture of Syracuse University. <laughs> all right. And here's a picture of the actual address, all right? So, uh, the reason why we're looking at all these different pictures is you have to think about the internet as a way to deliver information. Jerry the Mailman, all right, who's a wonderful guy, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> he's the one who's gonna give you the information, all right? And the internet's gonna give you the information as well. And it does that, but it has to know the, the address of different places, all right? So if you just send something to Syracuse University, it's not gonna be specific enough, all right? But, or 900 South Krause Avenue, which is where the, the main building is, all right, that's a much more specific address, all right? Again, it's easier for you as a human being to, rep, to remember a Syracuse University than it is to remember 900 South Krause Avenue, all right? You could probably remember that too, all right? But, when you have to think about the thousands and thousands of things that you might have to remember, it, you know, the more detail specific, it's harder to remember. So think of it that way. So there are things called domain name servers that make this job easy for us. So we don't have to remember a bunch of IP addresses, you know, uh, remember a bunch of domain names. Right? So it takes the, um, it's like a, a phone book in a way, not that we use phone books anymore, <laughs> but uh, it will take the, um, the IP address of some website and so when you type in your browser, right, I'll take a look over here. So I want to go to 
I don't know, USA, USA Today, Today, right? I'm going to read the news. So when I type that in into the, uh, into the browser over here, I typed in the domain name. I didn't have to type in the HTTP oops. I don't know if that even works. See, it automatically. <laughs> see, uh, a lot of it is. I'll read over here. It tells you you do the site information. Connection is secure. So, um, the browser, modern browsers know that you that HTTP and all that kind of stuff is implied, right? So you don't have to type all that stuff in. If you type it in, it'll take you to the exact same place. So you're just giving yourself some more work. But what it does is it takes the uh, the domain name that you typed in, then it sends it to a domain name server, and it knows that when you type in USA Today, it takes this to whatever the IP address is uh, for uh, for the for this actual website. All right. All right. Let's see if I can find out what the IP address of US. So here's their IP address, right? All right, anyway. mm -hmm -hmm. They might just block it, but mm -hmm -hmm. but you get the idea, All right? So it takes a number, the IP address and it changes it into the domain name. Or when you type in a domain name, it changes it to, um, to the, uh, the domain name server. It takes a look at whatever the domain name is that you typed up. It says this is the, it matches up to an IP address, and it sends you there. And then we have to deal with uh, servers, all right? So uh, it's a computer program or machine, all right, that waits for requests from other uh, uh, machines or software and responds to them. And now it could be looking up for uh, like a like an image. It could be uh, anything really. It could be uh, some uh, some text. It could be a uh, you know a domain name, right? Like the, we just talked about domain domain name servers. So you type in uh, like the the domain name, right? And it, it's requesting some information. What is the IP address for whatever this website is? And it says oh, here it is, and it sends you there, right? Or uh, you want to. Uh, some music, listen to some music or a YouTube video or whatever it is, right? So it's looking for some certain information and it finds that information and then it plays it for you or it gives it to you, all right? So let's think about some things that make up a good website. So three things that we have to think about that make up a good website. We've got design, functionality, UI it's called, right? And usability, right? So UI is like a user interface, right? How easy it is to use something, and, um, I mean, how well it works. And usability, UX, user experience, is how easy it is to use it. All right, so first off, let's look at design. All right, uh, you wanna make sure you have a good use of color, right? So color sets the mood and tone of your site, right? So well, you see a lot of sites they use uh, blue as a, a predominant color. All right. A lot of people like blue. Right. It's one of my favorite colors. Uh, so it, you associate blue with trust, peace, order, and loyalty. All right. So you get face box is blue, Dropbox. Not that people use Dropbox. Well, some, I guess people still use Dropbox. I have Dropbox. So a lot of politicians wear like blue suits. Right. Uh, and yellow and reds are alert colors that draw a lot of attention. So you see, like uh, politicians nowadays, they wear like a uh, like a red tie, all right? It's like a power tie, so it kind of draws attention to them. All right. Greens are a, a good call to action color, all right? I'll talk about calls to action later, and they help uh, influence users to do something, all right? So you have to use color in the right way at the right time with the right audience and for the right purpose. So you have to think about what is the, the purpose of your website and use colors that go along with that. Like if you're building 
like you know a website for some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, some kind of park or something like that. You probably want to use like greens and browns and maybe some yellows and that kind of stuff. So a well-done color palette can go a long way to enhance the user experience. Right, so here we've got a website. It's got a lot of nice uh, purples. All right, they've got a lot of uh, white space over here. Right, so you can see it's got like a, kind of a theme as far as purples go. Right, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Spotify again, we have a lot of white space and over here. We've got our green color over here for our call to action They want you to like me say the this over here is free, you know But this little oh, this looks much more attractive. It's nice and green nice and safe, right? Uh, readability all right, so you want to make sure you use a, a small number of fonts you don't want to use uh, fill up your website with a whole bunch of fonts. Like I know, like a lot of people's first inclination when they get a, a toolbox is they want to use as many of the tools as possible. So they want to use as many of the cool fonts as they can. Right? Uh, don't use Comic Sans. <laughs> I mean, Comic Sans is a, is a widely hated uh, internet font. I mean, a font, internet font, a font that uh, people don't like. Right? <laughs> it's kind of like a you know, like an amateurish, I guess. Uh, People look down upon it for whatever reason. All right, uh, you want to use for the for the for the most part your um, your fonts. You want to use like a size 12 to 16, which is you know a, a pretty standard size font. Not too big, not too small. It's nice and read. You can always uh, change it so that people can um, make it so that people can change the size of their fonts, of course. But uh, readability. All right. And then, of course, you'll have headlines and all that kind of stuff later, but we're not going to worry about that too much right now. And then optimal line length, all right, is you don't want to, you know, your, 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 um, your, uh, your text to take up the whole width of your screen, unless you're, usually, like I said, on a, on a mobile device, it might take up most of your screen, but on a, like a, on a PC, it's going to be, if it takes up the whole width of your screen, that's too much, all right? And generally speaking, you don't want to do like highlighting and weird colors and that sort of stuff. All right, meaningful graphics. All right, so you want to use graphics. You don't want to like overload your website with graphics. Right, you have to be be sparing with them. If you have too much going on, it's too distracting for the user. All right, so uh, photos are great. They can help set the mood. All right, uh, they can quickly give a message to your audience. But you want to be, like I said, be sparing with them. You don't want to like overload your user with a whole bunch of pictures, right? Uh, if it doesn't give you useful information, all right, or doesn't you know um, help perform your their, their task, all right, then you probably don't need to put it on there, all right? So if it doesn't help the user better understand something, teach us how to use something, or show us how something is done, maybe you don't need it as far as graphics go. And I'm going to say graphics. I don't just mean pictures. I also mean like, you know, buttons and you know, uh, direction arrows and all that kind of stuff. Like here's a website. It really only has just the one image. All right, one image. It's got one button over here, a nice big call to action to get started, and it's got contact sales. You can watch the video. So very simplistic. This is like a, a, a like a splash page they call it, where just to kind of get a person started. So it's very minimal. Not every website has to be like this, or every web page has to be like this. But a lot of times you're going to start off with something when you when the user first goes to your site, right? They're going to start off in something that's kind of like simplistic, and is um is a uh, aim to get the user just to. Uh, uh, get the user um, easily into your website without having to look around too much, right? So keep it simple. Ever heard of KISS? Keep it simple, stupid, all right? No one here is stupid. <laughs> so keep it simple. Let's go with keep it simple, K-I-S. All right. So white space. The concept of white space is just you want to have a lot. It doesn't necessarily have to be white, although white is probably the most commonly used color for white space. Is you want to make sure that uh, you, you 
you have a lot of space between things, so it's easy to find where stuff is. All right? If everything's jammed together, it makes it difficult. And uh, just people, at least nowadays, they kind of find more aesthetically pleasing. The aesthetics change. Aesthetics is, you know, the concept of like what is beautiful, essentially, and, and what is pretty, think of it that way. Aesthetics change, but right now the current aesthetics are the, a good use of white space. So we're trying to figure out how do, we don't want to overload our websites with too much stuff jam-packed into one one spot. We want to make sure that our our, uh, our website has space between things, so it's easy to find where stuff is. Uh, you can uh, use a grid layout, and there are things that we can use that will do a grid layout for you, so you don't have to do it by hand. We'll get into those kind of things later, but um, uh, so. Let's take a look at what I mean by a grid layout. Let's take a look at uh, the aforementioned uh, like USA Today, right? Now you can see over here, there's, there's an ad up top over here. But then there's like um, one, two, three columns over here, up to this part. So we've got this skinnier column over here, this wider column here in the middle, and then this other, this uh, medium-sized column over here. And a lot over here. There's a lot of white space over here. All right. So you get the idea. Everything's not jammed. There's a lot of information on here. Let's go to like another website, like I don't know, Apple.com, right? Again, a lot of empty space. Again, when I say white space, it doesn't necessarily have to be white. It could just be any color. All right. Again, white is the most commonly used uh, uh, color for white space. But it doesn't have a lot of extra stuff so that doesn't need to be there. Over here, again, we've got another grid. All right. This one takes up the whole width. Whole width. All right. And then we've got two columns over here. One, two. So very simple as far as how the website is laid out, right? It's got a, we've got a menu bar up top over here, or an app bar, I should say. COVID-19 thing, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. There are a lot of different kind of grids that you can use. Right. So, uh, so what you want to like plan all this out ahead of time, essentially, before we start worrying about our websites. But when you look at a website, think about look at how they set out their grids. Is it complicated? Is it you know is it e easy to figure out what the grid is? I mean, or it doesn't necessarily have to be. Is it like super simple grids? It's just got like two things on it, or what? It, think about this, and then think about how, why, why they made that decision to to make a, a website like that. What is it? that made them choose that grid. All right, we've got to worry about functionality, all right, page load times. All right, so you want to make sure that your website loads quickly. All right, so if you've got a bunch of you know, animations and a bunch of like movies and stuff like that, your page is going to load slower all right, than if it's you know, uh, you know, simple and, uh, and uh, it uh, doesn't have a lot of extra stuff on it. So uh, you want to make sure that your stuff is mobile friendly. So uh, you want to make sure that uh, when someone looks at your website, they get the same information. There might be s some less stuff on it, and stuff might get you know squished into it, um, into a different form. But you want to make sure that someone on their website that goes on, on their phone, which is the way a lot of, a lot of people probably when the, maybe the majority of people nowadays get their information or they actually access the web is on their phones or their iPad or whatever, mostly their phones. We want to make sure that their information is basically essentially the same on their phone as it is on a PC. And you want to make sure that everything on your site works, all right? So if they click on a link, it takes you somewhere. They don't get some 404 error or anything like that. Or if they fill out a form, the form actually works. Uh, usability. Is your content organized and concise? 
So users don't read a website, they scan. They look around for information, and, and uh, I think uh, they use like what's called like an F pattern, but we'll get into that some other time. So they just scan information once they, aha, there it is, right? Then they find they focus on that and they read that part over there, right? So can you quickly find what you're what you're looking for? And you can design your websites that kind of go along with the way that people tend to look at websites, and uh, and make it easy to find that way. We'll get into that later. Is it intuitive enough? All right. To do you need to explain how to do something? All right. If you need to explain how to do it, then it's not easy to use. So it should be like basically, oh, people should automatically know by based off their basic information of what the internet is of how to do things on your website. If they have to figure it out, then they're, they're going to get frustrated and they might leave. Can I use it anytime and anywhere? All right. So um, uh, whether or not you're in, you know, Zimbabwe or if you're in, you know, uh, New Jersey or wherever it is you are, all right. Can you have, and if it's two o'clock in the morning, you know, or at 10 o'clock at, at night, uh, can they, uh, will they have the same experience on your website? Uh, cross browser compatibility. Uh, uh, so, this is the website's ability to function and display properly across different browsers. So, nowadays we've got Chrome, we've got Firefox, we've got Microsoft Edge, uh, we've got all different kinds of browsers, Opera. Not the, I mean, there are some are more, the most popular one, of course, is Chrome, all right? But you want to make sure that your website works essentially the same, there might be slight differences, all right, uh, across different browsers. So some uh, browsers will have uh, different, as different things that they can do and others can't. All right, so just because your website works great on on Google Chrome, some things might not look so great on Microsoft Edge or whatever you know, whatever uh, other version people are using. Right, so there are a lot of different text editors. There's the Sublime Text. There's Brackets, Notepad Plus um, Plus. There's Atom. You can see this one over here. This is I think the one I'm gonna try to recommend. Uh, this semester, we'll see how it goes. Like, like I said, if you can do um, HTML and CSS on any uh, on any uh, notepad editor, or so or any uh, text editor that you want, you could even just do it in a, in a text document. Like you could go to Notepad, right? You can make a website just in Notepad. <laughs> it's not ter terribly. I mean, it's very basic. There doesn't have a lot of features to it, but you could do you could make a website just in Notepad. Uh, this is for the the other guy. I don't know about this, but we may or may not use Slack in uh, in this class. We'll see. All right, and that is the end of our first thing of notes for today. All right, so I hope I didn't ramble too much. I hope it made some kind of sense for you guys. So what I want you guys to do is, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, that whatever document uh, you like. All right, go ahead and transfer these notes into that document, attach it to the assignment, and turn that in when you're ready. It will be worth 10 points, classroom points, and we'll take it from there, okay? So hopefully this works. See how it goes. <laughs> I hope everyone has a good day. I will see you uh, in the, the Zoom meeting at 10-16. Uh, Have fun, everyone.